Hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence. And the intelligence, of course, I have to say, comes to my guests. Otherwise, I wouldn't be wasting the listener's time and the guest time. And uh, I do want to learn from you, David Lindorf, a longtime journalist. And he he worked on a, a movie that I did a podcast on. It's sort of an addendum or, or alternative to Oppenheimer, a movie being much honored. Uh, and which also did very well at the box office. And their movie is called A Compassionate Spy. And we went through the whole making of that movie. And it's about a guy named Ted Hall, who at the age, I think, 18, was a Harvard student and was a genius uh, in physics. And uh, he uh, was recruited to work on the secret atomic bomb project at Los Alamos. He was the youngest member of the staff, but his brilliance was recognized by people who went on to win Nobel Prizes. And I think one or two had already, well, their work had already been done uh, to to earn that prize. And he, uh, it, what the movie was called The Compassion Spy. This book, which let me hold up for people who have it on video, uh, is called uh, Spy for No Country. The story of Ted Hall, the teenage atomic spy who may have saved the world. Now, that's a, a, a mouthful uh, to expect an audience to think that a spy saved the world in the World War II. Oh, my God. And he gave these secrets to a Russian, a Soviet agent and so forth. Calls into uh, question a lot of things. And in your book, you actually say uh, that this is what Oppenheimer should have done. I don't know if that's your editorializing, but why don't we begin with that? Because we, we there's two things about Oppenheimer movie. I think it's a very important movie, and I'm glad it's a uh, has a mass audience because we should think about the creation of this this weapon that haunts us maybe more now than ever uh, because there's so many nations that have it, and we have a really fraught relation with the inheritors to the Soviet Union uh, arsenal, uh, <clears throat> Putin's Russia, even though he's deliberately an anti-communist, we still have the rhetoric of the Cold War going. And uh, uh, Donald Trump was even accused of being uh, maybe himself a spy or an agent or too sympathetic uh, to the Russians under Putin. Nonetheless, uh, I want to want to get into this because uh, what is it that Oppenheimer didn't do that you think Ted Hall did that's admirable? Let's just start with the most controversial point. Welcome. Yeah. Well, you know, people Welcome are with, a, with an easy softball question. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. Thanks a lot. Uh, no, I've thought about that a bit. Uh, that uh, you know, people are thinking that they know Oppenheimer from the movie. It's it's does him some justice and some injustice. Uh, but the the thing about Oppenheimer is that he was c accused uh, very seriously of being a Soviet spy, that he, uh, you know, his brother was a communist, his wife was a communist, former communist bef before she married him. He had leftist leanings and, you know, had attended meetings of organizations that were sort of... Uh, uh, front groups of the Communist Party. And, uh, you know, he traveled in those circles. And um, so there was a, a, a great deal of suspicion that he was a spy. Uh, we now know from released transcripts of the investigations that were done into him in, in lifting his security clearance, he couldn't do any research on nuclear issues after uh, the end of the war because his security clearance was lifted and he, he died uh, a, pretty much a broken man because he couldn't even do the work that he uh, he had, you know, pioneered. Um, and so he wasn't a spy. And, and I said that, you know, he knew so much about the bomb. He knew that they, he tried to stop it uh, later and, um, he, he sort of half-heartedly then, then full out tried to stop it being used. Uh, but he should have done what Ted did. 
and be, because he had all the knowledge. Ted, uh, just so that people get the story at, at, at the setup, is that he, after six months of being at Los Alamos working on the plutonium bomb's implosion device, saw that the Germans uh, were losing the war and were being bombed to smithereens at that point by U.S. and British bombers day and night, every day, uh, taking out all their infrastructure. And so, you know, the scientists realized uh, uh, and Ted realized that the Germans were not going to get the bomb by, by September of 1944. And uh, some of them were trying to prevail on Roosevelt to bring the Soviets in on the project at that point. They were our allies. And uh, and then uh, Ted looked at that, saw that it was not going to work. And so he reached the decision at the tender age of 18, right before his 19th birthday, that the only thing that would work to prevent the what he saw as a terrifying catastrophe of the U.S. having a monopoly on the bomb after the war would be for another country to have the bomb that could stop the U.S. from using it. And uh, and so that's what he did. He decided to be a spy uh, and, he and he did it. And he gave the information, really everything about the plutonium bomb to the Soviet unions. And they wound up making a copy of the Nagasaki bomb and blowing it off in August of 1949. So we should be clear because people don't have much of a developed sense of history and going back to, to World War II, uh, and I'm a bit uh, 10 years older than you, so I was born in 36. And, you know, everybody forgets uh, that the relations with the Soviet Union were quite complex and with Western Europe and so forth. There were plenty of people who thought that Hitler could come to reason. Uh, there were plenty, there was a significant view in the United States that wasn't our business anyway, even though France came to be conquered. And the fact is, uh, with a lot of support from the United States, material support, Lend-Lease and what have you, it was the Soviet Union uh, under Stalin that really, uh, you know, was had well, of course been attacked by Hitler and was doing the main fighting. And, and one could even argue that the, they had turned back uh, the German forces, and in fact, uh, really stopped the international threat of German army at that point uh, when the United States got involved. We were very late to opening the Second Front, as it was called. And, uh, you know, uh, so there was a lot of sentiment. First of all, uh, the, the Communist Party in the United States uh, was intimately associated with labor organizing in response to the Great Depression, uh, and the steel, automobile, uh, coal mining, and so forth, uh, big industries, uh, longshore out here on the West Coast. And they were involved in the early civil rights movement. Everybody forgets the U.S. military was racially segregated at the time of World War II. And they were, you know, so they were a center of, of a certain idealism. And uh, was not unusual, uh, in Oppenheimer uh, was at Berkeley at that time, that there was sentiment not only there, but at Harvard and elsewhere, uh, that we should get along. And of course, that was Roosevelt's position. They were our ally. And so, but uh, it seems to me that this, in the movie Oppenheimer, there are two things left out. Uh, one, uh, whether building the bomb was necessary at that point or using it. And it's briefly treated. We have Oppenheimer and others appealing to Truman not to drop it on human beings. And what one could argue is an act, of, an enormous act of uh, terrorism. If by terrorism we mean uh, targeting civilians, these were in Nagasaki and Hiroshima two targets that were clearly primarily civilian targets. They had no serious military significance, and nor was Japan a threat to us anyway. Germany was finished. Uh, as has surrendered, and uh, Japan was all an argument about could they keep their emperor or not, but it really uh, was not a, a existential threat to the United States or anything when we dropped the bomb. So why don't you revisit, since you've done a lot of research, your book is very detailed on what these folks were thinking, 
what the conversation might have been like among these scientists, uh, I'd like to go a little bit further uh, about why they didn't want to use it. A good number of them did. Now, Edward Teller, of course, wanted to immediately proceed to an even uh, more frightening bomb, you know, the uh, hydrogen bomb. But, but, but still, uh, that this was not an implausible position, that we've created this monster weapon and we ought to, you know, at least uh, alert, which we never did, uh, in, except in the vaguest ways, our ally, uh, that we had it, and maybe we should share it. We, I'd like to visit that argument a little, and your book does. Yeah, okay. Well, we, you have to go back to 1939 when, when uh, actually it was Leo Szilard, who was a student of Einstein, Einstein's and was one of the leading figures of the bombs development at uh, Los Alamos. In 1939, he went to... Uh, to um, Einstein and said, you know, I need to have you sign a letter. I'll write it. Uh, you can amend it as you want, but uh, I want you to sign it because I'm nobody and you're really important uh, to Roosevelt and say, we need to have a, a, a crash program to develop the atomic bomb because the Germans have the knowledge to do it. And are, there are, there's evidence that they're starting to look into it. This was in 1939, before the U.S. was even in the war. And, uh, and Einstein agreed to do it. And it was sent uh, to a banker, a friend of his, who was an advisor to uh, Roosevelt. And it got to him fairly quickly. And he did it. He established the, the beginnings of, of a research into the... Uh, the idea of an atomic bomb. Now, they really knew how to make the atomic bomb if, if the, out of uranium. What they didn't know how to do was to isolate the U-235 out of the, uh, the raw uranium in order to make a simple bomb. Because a U-235 bomb, you can just slam two pieces together in a closed kind of cannon with the, you know, two pieces hitting each other from... Uh, you know, at, at high speed, and then you get the explosion. Nothing complicated. You, a high schooler could do it if they could get the U-235. The other bomb, the plutonium bomb that Ted worked on, much more complicated, but in the end, uh, a, 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 a substance that was much easier to obtain because it was a waste product of uh, any nuclear reactor and you isolate it chemically. So, um, so they were working on two strands. Um, the, the Germans had, the evidence was that they had ceased exporting any uranium from the uranium mines in Silesia uh, that, they, that they had gained control of. And the, the only reason they would have done that, it, it was argued, was because they were going to use it themselves in their research and, and in developing a bomb. So that was the start. And then they'd made this massive project. It was, unhe nothing had ever been li done like it before. It ended up being tens of thousands of scientists working on it. Uh, what amounted to, you know, maybe a hundred billion dollars in current dollars spent on that project. Uh, they, they built Oak Ridge, they built Hanford, they built, built the assembly, uh, a project at Los Alamos. They were in Columbia uh, University with a reactor there. It was, it was all over the country making this top secret project, and they kept it secret from the Russians. And uh, they eventually brought the British in and brought scientists who were working on the secret project too uh, to Los Alamos to speed it up and get it the bomb. But uh, that, so that was the start. And then, you know, the reason, of course, was to get it before the Germans did. But as I mentioned, by the end of 1944, or even the fall of 1944, the, there were, Germany was being bombed to smithereens, firebombing of Bremen and, you know, uh, of, of Hamburg. Industrial centers were being taken out completely. Their railroads were, destroy, were destroyed. Uh, that there's no way a country under that circumstance was going to be able to build the bomb, and they didn't have it. So 
so everybody was saying we can't do it. At what at that point, um, several things happened. One was that Leslie Groves, the general who was in charge of the whole Manhattan Project, was heard at a dinner hosted uh, for him by the British uh, scientists in the project at uh, at um, the home of one of their top scientists, and. Um, at the, during dessert, they were talking about how the Germans weren't going to get the bomb and maybe they should, uh, you know, not go ahead and make it. And so Leslie Groves stood up and he said, well, as you, as you, uh, well, he said that the bomb needs to be built. And he said it was not built for the Germans. You should know that you know, it was built to control the Russians. Now that went all around the the, the uh, Los Alamos camp because in in Los Alamos, they, one of the things Oppenheimer insisted on was that for this to work, they had it was top secret. Everything that went in or out was in subject to inspection. People were followed to make sure they weren't spies case, you know, briefcases were open. Uh, they were allowed to go to Albuquerque and to Santa Fe, but they had to say where they were going and phones were tapped. There were only two phones on the Los Alamos uh, at all, and those were closely monitored. Um, so, but he said, inside the camp, anybody can talk about anything. That's the only way we're going to get this done. This has to be a, a, a open campus, like a university where you can really, you know, share ideas and find and come up with ideas. So, uh, so this went around really quickly and a lot of people were upset. Um, uh, Josef Rotblat, who was one of the senior scientists actually quit in, I think, either late October or in November, he quit. Uh, and the reason he quit was he said he didn't want to be a part of a project that was developing the bomb for use against the Russians. And he was Pole, and the, the Poles aren't particularly fond of Russians historically, but he, he felt that that was wrong. And for that, all his, all his papers, everything he'd been working on were taken from him. And he wasn't allowed to leave the country, even though he wanted to get back to his wife in Poland. Um, and Niels Bohr, who was the sort of uh, senior figure at the project, uh, an already a Nobel physicist of, of huge stature, right up there with Einstein, he uh, appealed to Roosevelt directly and said, you've got to tell the Russians about this. And, and, you know, we've got to bring them in on this. And for that, Roosevelt had him uh, investigated by the FBI and he, it was, he had a hard time going back to his native Denmark um, because of that. He was kept in the US for a while. They were afraid he was gonna to go to the Russians. Um, so this was the kind of setting. Szilard also uh, wrote a, a letter and, and you know he got himself in trouble. So um, that that was the situation that Ted was looking at, and so then that's why he thought this is not going to work. That the the idea of appealing to Roosevelt or later appealing to Truman is even worse. Um, is not going to work. You know there was this there was the story of uh, in the movie they had it, and it's true that Oppenheimer went to Roosevelt uh, to say you know, that something had to be done about the bomb. This was after it was used uh, and he wanted something to be done to, to, to get it put to an end to it. And he said, you know, all those babies, all those pe people killed, you know, I'm, I've got blood on my hands. And Truman got mad at him. He yelled at him, you've got blood on your hands. I did it. You know, don't talk to me, you crybaby. You know, he, he really was angry. So that wasn't working. Ted already realized that uh, before it even happened, he realized that what the the appeals that were being made were hopeless. And so he decided where, who should I give it to? And he actually had a discussion with his 
uh, Courier and Harvard roommate, Saville Sachs, who's an interesting character. Uh, and and th they talked about that. And Sachs said, well, you can't give it to the French or the British. They're not going to stop the U.S. from using it after the war if, if they have a monopoly. Uh, you have to give it to the Russians. They're the only ones that could stop the U.S. And, and Ted agreed with that. You know, this is such an interesting part of the history because it goes to sort of the basic uh, question of uh, second half of the last century and actually right up to now, uh, was the Cold War necessary? Uh, was it were deliberately brought on? And clearly, uh, you know, the uh, nuclear arms race in the Cold War is what gave it its existential quality and, and titled fear and concern, because otherwise, after the war, Russia would have plenty of its own troubles trying to rebuild its economy and, and work and was there, <laughs> couldn't really. And, and by the way, there'd been, again, it's the history that people don't go through it, but I mean, there was a, a lively history about what Europe would look like after. And there's a lot of argument. What did Churchill agree with Stalin about what would happen to Eastern Europe and so forth? And that all fed in uh, because much of that was kept from us, what really was discussed at Yalta and Potsdam and so forth. So, oh, the Russians are moving now through Eastern Europe. And so, but that was all understood and, and that, that it was go, uh, going to happen and that uh, there were territorial interests, both for Western Europe and for the United States as well as Russia. All of that sort of was kept away. Uh, and we had this Cold War. And I remembered one of the individuals that shows up uh, in both uh, your movie and the Oppenheimer movie and everything, is Hans Bethe. And Hans Bethe also won a Nobel Prize. I forget exactly when he won it, but for his research he did in the 30s. And he's somebody I got to know uh, as an elder person. He spoke actually at UC Irvine. I had a program there where he spoke. And uh, a really brilliant fellow. And he was full of an incredible angst and concern about what he had wrought. I think he was in charge of theoretical work at Los Alamos, theoretical physics. And, and uh, you know, in the end, last years, he was all upset with Edward Teller, who was one of the people who didn't have any remorse. Uh, and, uh, and the irony is that Teller was a refugee from Hungary, which after all had collaborated as a nation with Hitler, it was, you know, as opposed to Poland, uh, it was supposed to be occupied according to the wartime agreements. But the, but the irony in all this is that it, it just comes out of nowhere. And in fact, in the Oppenheimer movie, the, the serious uh, the failure or omission of that movie is to ignore the, the victims. I mean, you know, that, that there were, why are you dropping this bomb on human beings, breaking what these scientists thought would be a code that you wouldn't use it unless you absolutely had to use it, right? And and uh, otherwise, it's inherently a weapon of terrorism. But I would like you to go a little bit more into that mood that Hall was in, because now, after all, his seniors, including you know up through uh, outside physicists, like I, I said, are very concerned about the implications of this weapon. He is in the position; he's an undergraduate. And so is his roommate. And they're saying these adults are out of control and they're unleashing this incredible weapon and they're not going to be able to stop it because the actual politicians, beginning with Roosevelt and Truman, uh, and certainly Leslie Grove, the general, was a representative of that, we're spending money and we're building a weapon and we have to justify it. And so what he did, which now would seem very extreme, he said, uh, well, I can, I can stop that. And, and that's so I want to get at your, in the movie you call him the compassionate spy, in your book you say the spy for no country. Now, some people would say, wait a minute, he was a spy for the Soviet Union. What do you mean a spy for no country? Well, I, I wrote that title because I, I realized, you know, I mean, and Ted, Ted says this in the movie. I mean, he says that he was doing it uh, to with within mind the saving the people of the Soviet Union and the people of the world that that his concern was that this bomb was going to be used by the US if you have it you use it and 
and he was correct. I mean, one of the things that I document in the book was that, and this is not known widely by anybody in the United States, is that before they even finished and uh, tested the bomb successfully, they had, had already begun researching how to mass produce the atomic bomb that they uh, that they knew they were going to have. They knew they were going to have the uh, the uranium bomb. They didn't know until they tested the Trinity bomb whether they had it down for the plutonium one. But they were going to have the bomb, and so uh, they they but they were handmade. It, it by the time of of after those two bombs were dropped, they had no more. And the, the next one wasn't built, completed until December of 1945. And then, you know, they made a few after that. Uh, they had, I think they had six bombs by the end of 1946. It was a very slow process, but they did figure out how to mass produce them so that by 1948, they were making 100 a year. And, uh, and, you have to ask yourself, they, th they thought, they still at, at that time did not know that the Soviets had penetrated at Los Alamos. It wasn't, it wasn't really until 1949 that the first inkling of the spy, of the, that there were spies in Los Alamos came out to the FBI from the work of the precursor to the National uh, Security Agency. NSA. So uh, it was called the Sys uh, Signal Intelligence Service of the Army originally. And they had all these uh, coded cables they had copied coming out of the Soviet consulate, but they didn't know what they said. It was a very complicated code and took years to crack. So all that time, they thought that uh, the Russians were going to take, the Soviets were going to take 10 years to, at least to get the bomb. And so why, if that was the case, were they spending in peacetime with no threats from anybody, uh, the U.S. having won the war, hands down, uh, the Soviet Union being destroyed totally by the war that it had just fought on its own territory against the Germans, why did they want continue to spend even vaster amounts of money to mass produce 400 bombs by 1950. And, and the reason is they had plans to preemptively destroy the Soviet Union with the, what the Pentagon said would require 400 bombs so that it would no longer be an industrial society. And, and the, uh, I, I mean, I th that's enormous evidence that they had that plan. They even had a terminology for a day which was the day that the Soviets would get the bomb on their own and have an, enough made that the U.S. could not realistically say they could attack them without the possibility of a uh, retaliatory strike from the Soviet Union, you know, like smuggling a bomb into New York Harbor and destroying New York. So they, they, they were acutely aware that, if, that they had to stop them before they got, you know, too many bombs. And they didn't think that would happen until the like mid fifties. And when did it happen? Uh, well, it happened in August 29th, 1949, when they exploded a, a carbon copy of the Nagasaki bomb, courtesy of Ted Hall and Klaus Fuchs. And, and so, so, I mean, I just want to point this out. Let me show the cover of the book and, or, and describe it for people on the radio. Uh, it's, it's called The Spy for No Country, the story of Ted Hall, the teenage atomic spy who may have saved the world. Now, again, uh, this is a controversial notion, but the, the importance of this book, and I want to get to that, is you have spent, what, how many years have you been on this? And, uh, and you, you got to know his wife now, who's now no longer with us, his widow, you got you. You really got into this. Describe the the research that went into this. Yeah, uh, my my work on this dates back to um, really uh, 2018. In 2017, I wrote a uh, an article com in commemoration of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, which I had done periodically through my life as a journalist. Every few years, I would. I, you know, is a very profound thing that happened. And I really, as a 
as a Vietnam anti-war activist uh, I and, and war resistor, I, I had, um, you know, really strong feelings about what had happened to Japan at the end of the war. And, and so I would write these articles, but, you know, I tried to come up with a different angle and something new to say each time. And I was running out. So I, you know, that year in, uh, in uh, 2017, I, it dawned on me, I wonder who these spies were who actually gave the Russians the plans to the bomb and, and, and made it a two sided, you know, weapon. And uh, so I looked on Google and I came, one of the things I saw was a row of pictures of all the atomic spies, the Soviet atomic spies. And there were like eight of them. And most of them were, you know, balding and older uh, and, uh, you know, at least middle-aged. And then there was this one pimply faced kid. And, and I thought, who the hell is that? And so, uh, you know, I looked at him and I mean, here's here's a picture of him. It's a, it's the movie poster uh, from the festivals. I mean, look at him. If you look at it carefully, you can see pimples all over his forehead. He had a serious case of acne. Um, that's a high school kid. So, um, by the way, next to it, you have the I Izzy Award. Yeah, that's my Izzy Award. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. Uh, full disclosure, I also won one of those. Uh, but uh uh, I. F. Stone was one of the great American journalists and was very independent in challenging the origin of the Cold War. And uh, absolutely, yeah. And he's nowadays he's honored even at Harvard and elsewhere. But at the time, he, he took a lot of heat. But go ahead. So so anyway, I I wrote I I looked up Ted and there was information about him because there was this book Bombshell, which is a, a, a masterful book done by two Cox News reporters, uh, Joseph Albright, Albright, who is from the, uh, the family, the, the Patterson family, the newspaper family, and uh, multi-generational journalist, uh, and um, uh, Marcia Kunstel, uh, who he eventually was married to. Uh, and they wrote this book in 19... Uh, 1997, uh, two years after Ted was exposed as a spy um, in the, one of the first cables successfully translated uh, of the Soviet cables actually named Ted. They got it spelled wrong. They called him Theodor Kohl, K-H-O-L-L. <clears throat> but they figured it out because it said that he was uh, the, the son of a furrier, uh, and was uh, a student at Harvard and stuff. So they identified him and it was pretty quick. And um, so anyway, he, he was exposed in 1995 and, and these guys went straight to England and tried to get an interview with him. And the, he was reticent at first, but finally they decided that uh, after being visited by somebody from uh uh, the Reader's Digest, <laughs> and they they decided they'd go with these guys because they were seeming pretty straightforward and sympathetic with uh, his with what he had done. So so they did the book, and it it was a great book. What it lacked was that they couldn't get the FBI files uh, because Ted wasn't dead, and the FBI had done something weird. They had their file was on Ted and Savile Sachs and they were merged. And so even though Sachs had died in 1980, you couldn't get his file because they would have had to segregate out Ted Hall in 1980 because Ted was still alive. And uh, they, they, so they, they just weren't available until after Ted died in 1999. You should mention so that the, under the Freedom of Information Act, you can get these files without the permission of the person if they're dead. Any dead person, you can yeah. get their file. And, yeah. and by, the, by the way, uh, just in that connection, you should mention, because your book goes into it in detail, and the movie does also, Ted Hall's brother. Uh, yeah, that's was, an amazing story. That's mind-boggling. To, why don't you describe his brother? And that was one reason why the government initially didn't move uh, against him, right? 
for a long time they didn't. Yeah. yeah. So and tell that story. Yeah. Too late. Um, well, Ted. Well, he was, helped develop the MX missile, right? He invented the Minuteman. Yeah, the, the whole time. Yeah. And in fact, he invented the whole concept of having a solid fuel ICBMs buried in, in uh, you know, by the hundreds in silos uh, and uh, able to be launched uh, just by pushing a button because they were already fueled and ready to go. That was his yeah. idea. So and these are two brothers who, uh, and, and also Ted Hall, you didn't mention, but he was actually critical for figuring out the trigger mechanism for exploding the bomb, wasn't he? Well, he didn't figure it out, but he he was in charge of the testing to refine it so it would work. It's very complicated. It's 32 segments that had to fit together perfectly in an explosion from every direction, and it had to be timed exactly to the millisecond, or it would uh, spread it apart instead of making it blow up. And so, I mean, it was a mind-blowing engineering feat, really, to get all those pieces together and to trigger at exactly the right time. And and uh, that was what he was working on. He was blowing it off. They they were using uh, um, a uh, chemical called lanthanum, which and measuring the gamma outburst from exploding that into a. Uh, you know, in, from every side. And uh, what they were trying to do was get it so that it would have an equal spray of gamma rays in every direction. And then when they would do it, actually with a t with with the plutonium test, which they did in uh, July 16th of 1945 at the Trinity test, that, you know, they only got one shot <laughs> to experiment with, because uh, that's a big. Those experiments make a huge explosion. Um, so they they were looking for an equal spray of neutrons to make the chain reaction to uh, to uh, fission all the uranium, uh, uh, the plutonium that was assembled around uh, a uh, little initiator. So. Uh, that was his job. He was testing, 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 and he finally got it in February of 1945. And he was credited uh, by uh, Oppenheimer himself for his engineering work in putting this all together and making it work. So, uh, you know, he was known to Oppenheimer. But uh, this was after he was a spy. Yes, yes. He, he, the whole time he was doing it, he was hoping the Soviets were doing it too. And they were. But um, what... Th th but, but, I, mean, I want to nail that point down. Despite the fact that he was spying for the Soviets, he was also helping the United... Playing a decisive role in helping the United States get a workable uh, weapon. That's also true of Klaus Fuchs. Klaus Fuchs was a, was a German communist who fled uh, just ahead of the Gestapo uh, they were trying to arrest him after the uh, after the burning of the uh, Reichstag um, because he was a known communist activist um, in in uh, Kiel, and he he fled just ahead of them. They went to his family house, the, the, and that morning he had hopped a train to Berlin, and later he got out into France. Then he fled to England. And then he studied, uh, he took, he, he inherited the uh, um, graduate assistantship that Hans Bethe had um, at, and in, uh, I think it was University of Bristol. And um, so he was put on at the, the British tube alloys project because Klaus Fuchs was also a super brilliant guy, about 10 years older than Ted. And, and he, uh, wound up being one of the top brains on the British project. And then when they all moved to, to help speed up the, uh, they were invited to come over to the U.S. to speed up the um, development of the bomb, which was, you know, with the war coming towards an end, they needed all, all more scientists. Klaus Fuchs was brought over and he was put on the theoretical division uh, working on the uranium bomb mostly, but also he knew everything about the plutonium bomb too. And um, and in the, the weird thing about Fuchs is that after the war, he wasn't suspected. He 
uh, went back with the other Brits back to England, and England had been frozen out by Truman of the uh, of the nuclear project at that point. He didn't trust them to keep it secret, and so uh, you know, and keep keep the secrets. And so they had to work on their own in England. And guess who got put in charge of the British atomic bombs project, including the hydrogen bomb? Klaus Fuchs. He was the head of it. And, and so at the time he was caught uh, because of uh, a Venona cable, um, he was the head of the program. That's, that's totally amazing. The, yeah. the thing about the now here's the thing about that that we really need to mention and that is that the Soviets had gotten some information from Klaus Fuchs, they didn't trust it, they they wondered how could a guy who came over and was known to be a communist when he came to England as, as a refugee from the Nazis, how could he have become such an important figure in the British uh, nuclear project? And how could he have possibly been allowed by the US uh, into the Los Alamos project? Because they checked everybody. Um, and, and so they thought he must have turned. And, uh, and so um, he, they, they thought the information they were getting about the plutonium bomb was probably disinformation, you know, like the uh, U.S. tried to do to the Iranians, giving them, you know, a, a, a bum steer and throwing them off on their research. And and, so, and it made sense. You know, you'd say that doesn't make sense that he could have gotten through MI5, MI6, you know, and, and become, the you know, so important. But not before he, he was head, but he did that, too. Uh, but just being invited to Los Alamos and, and not uh, being suspected and thrown back, not allowed into the country. And so when Ted walked, Ted was actually a walk-in. He just walked in to a guy that he was told to see who might be able to get his information to the uh, right people at the consulate to alert the Soviets. The person he was told to go see unknown to him, was the recruiter for the uh, NKVD, the precursor of the KB, KGB. So he, he, he literally was a walk-in-the-door spy saying, I have this information. I'm a scientist at this secret site in New Mexico. I know about a super weapon that's being built that the Soviets need to know about. And, and the guy, you know, questioned him and asked him, you know, he said, well, well why should I believe you? Why? Why? why would anyone believe that you want to betray your country? And Ted said, because, and he told him, he said, I think it's going to be dangerous for the U.S. to, to have this weapon after the war all by itself. And, and he made a, a very articulate thing, a statement on that. And, you know, he ultimately was accepted as a spy. They trusted him. But more importantly, and, and I have this in the book, that, uh, Igor Kurchatov, the head of, who was the Oppenheimer for the Soviet project, which was very small at the time, uh, saw Ted's stuff, realized that Klaus Fuchs' stuff, which they were skeptical about, was real. And because Ted was saying the same thing, and they knew that Ted didn't know Klaus Fuchs uh, and vice versa, um, they it gave him the confidence to go to Stalin, who's not somebody that you want to make a mistake with, and tell him, look, uh, comrade, <laughs> what do they call him? Conrad Stalin, comrade Stalin, uh, we need to focus on making the plutonium bomb. We have the plans. We can make it, we can get the plutonium, we can copy these plans and we can do it, but we have to stop trying to make the uranium bomb because we're never gonna get enough U-235 in order to get it done in time to protect us. And, and Stalin bought it and he said, okay, and, and whatever you need, you get. And, and that was the big deal that allowed them to go all out and make the plutonium bomb. 
they figured, he said, you, we can do make, make the uranium bomb later, but we can't do it on a crash basis. So, the, the, first of all, we dropped the brother. Oh, yeah, the brother. Uh, uh, but, but it's interesting because Ted Hall, you know, here's this guy and you could question. Obviously, we're going to get to that, his motives, his wisdom and doing this and the need for sharing it and so forth. But here he's got his his brother who's playing an absolutely major role in U.S. defenses precisely against the possibility of the Russians having a bomb, right? That's what the... Yeah, well, uh, well the evolution of this is interesting. Ed was 11 years older than Ted. When Ted was four years old, it was evident to, to Ed, who was a brilliant engineering student at CCNY and uh, graduated with a master's in uh, electrical engineering and um, chemical engineering, and uh, he told his parents, Ted is a brilliant child. He can't just go to school. He needs special instruction. He needs to be challenged. And he said, I'm going to take charge of his education. This is a 15-year-old kid. And he said, I'm going to take charge of his education. And his parents, his mother was an a, a American-born Russian Jewish uh, uh, family's child, and the father had emigrated from Russia, a Jewish furrier, uh, uh, fleeing the you know the the uh, pogroms in Russia, and uh, had never gone to college. I don't think the mother had gone to college either, and they looked on their son saying, "I'm going to take charge of his education." As yeah, that makes sense. And so they allowed him to do that. And, and he was doing algebra at, I think, six years old, seven years old. Uh, you know, he just ate all of it up. And, and, he, and he really got interested in physics at an early age. And um, so, uh, so he got really steered. And, and at 14, he went to Queens College. And he got really bored there. And he wrote to his brother. Who what had, year did he go to Queens College? What? What, do you know what year that was that he went? Uh, 14, 22, would have been uh, 36. Huh. Uh, he, he, he was, uh, no, 25. Wait a minute, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 29. 39, 39, 1939. Uh, he was born in 1925, and he was 14. Yeah. I, I only bring that I happened to go to Queens College in engineering and then transferred to City College. So I know that trajectory. Uh, but Queens College was really quite small then, and then, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it, it's a good school, but he was bored yeah. at it, and and he, uh, and so uh, it had been a reformatory of some kind, and then evolved into a college. But go ahead, it's a well, minor well, years, minor footnote here. <laughs> two years into that, he um, he, uh, well, actually, he went to you know he went to um, what was the high school he went to? Um, I'm drawing a blank. I'll come back to it. But Science, one of the specialty schools, science or Stuyvesant? Or... No, it was a... Uh, Townsend Harris? Townsend Harris, which is at Queens. It was... Yeah, I mean, physically, yes. Townsend yeah. Harris. Right. Well, it was sort of under their wing. Um, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. It still, is, it still is, but at that it, time... It's interesting. It was... Diego Ramos, who's going to write the introduction on this, is a graduate of Townsend Harris. And he's very yeah, interested in his, his so history. I, yeah. I Diego at... Ramos, who's on the staff of our, our publication, Share Post, writes the intro to these uh, uh, these podcasts, and he graduated from Townsend Harris. It's a, a very important public uh, high school in New York. I looked at their I looked at their website and he was listed as one of their notable graduates. It said Ted Hall, uh, Los Alamos physicist, and Soviet spy. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's amazing. But uh, but then uh, you know they they took that down. I didn't. I can't find that anymore. That, oh. that he's listed as a Soviet spy and, and alum, notable alum. But there's a lot of notable alums from there. But anyway, uh, so he went there first, and he, he graduated from there at 14 and went on to uh, 
Queens. And then at Queens, he wrote his brother who had joined the U.S. Army Air Corps as an engineer and was repairing uh, bombers returning from Germany uh, so they could get back into the fight. And he, he got uh, uh, awards for uh, Distinguished Service Awards for inventing a way to do it much faster without taking the plane apart. And uh, so he that's what he was doing at the time. He gets a letter from his brother saying, I'm bored here. And he says, well, you should apply to Harvard. Well, the, the uh, application period was over, but Ted wrote them anyway and applied. And he sent in his grades and his recommendations, and they took him. And he, he was accepted as a junior physics major at uh, 16 when this happened uh, at Harvard and was studying uh, with an advisor, uh, uh, John Van Fleck, who's a super famous astrophysicist. And... Um, and that's who recommended him to uh, the guy that Oppenheimer sent to scour up some more scientists uh, to come help them speed up the project. But but Ed, uh, you know, went on from when he came back, uh, he got a, a master's degree uh, uh, in uh, in um, aircraft. Uh, what do you call it? Aviation engineering and uh, aeronautical engineering. And then uh, st he was still in the service. He, he got up to the rank of major. And then he was put on to a secret uh, rocket engine lab based at Wright-Patterson Air Base, top secret project. And they were developing motors for uh, rockets that could be ICBMs. So he helped to design the Thor, which was an IRBM. Then he, helped, then he uh, took a failed project, which was the Atlas. They just were not working. And they were basically trying to upscale the V2 engine, you know. And, and Ed came in and took over that project and basically redesigned the Atlas missile, which is still in use today. I mean, he did a fantastic job making a powerful rocket uh, that was the first real ICBM and went on from that to do the Titan, uh, which he always felt was a lousy missile and didn't make sense. Um, and, and then he started thinking solid fuel and he came up with the idea of a solid fuel rocket that you could just put in the ground and push a button and launch it uh, and considered that to be the best uh, preventive war thing ever imagined. And he, and he tried to sell it to the Air Force and, and you know, he wasn't having success. So he went to, of all people, like Curtis LeMay thought it was a great idea. Uh, and, that, and he convinced uh, Stimson who was the, uh, oh, no, no, it wasn't Stimson, who was the, uh, ah, I'm, I'm having a Cur before. Curtis LeMay, the Dr. Strangelove figure. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he convinced the Secretary of the Defense, uh, and they sold it to Eisenhower, you know. So ultimately, they they went with the Minuteman concept that, and he's now named it. He's a, like a honored figure at the uh, Air Force's uh, Museum of uh, Missiles and Aerospace in Colorado. I think Colorado Springs, uh, as you know, a pioneer. So, so of of rockets and, and missiles. did he cover for his brother a bit? I mean, he he remained close to him, didn't he? They, they were they were really really tight. And and uh, because there's a all... question: why why didn't the uh, intelligence agencies? Why didn't the government go after Ted Hall more vigorously? Well, this I was mean, what I discovered from going into their files. Because yeah. first of all, I th I wanted to know about Ed Hall because I knew that he did make the missile, the, the Minuteman missile. I thought that is really strange, and so I I wrote to the FBI. Uh, a FOIA application for Ed's file, and uh, and I got back that we don't have any file on Ed. You know, Ed Hall. We have Ted Hall, but we uh, and you have that, but we we uh, don't have any file on Ed. And I said that doesn't make any sense at all. I'm appealing, 
So I appealed. I said, look, this is a guy who was uh, the brother of an atomic spy. There certainly were security checks done of him, and that would have been a file. They, they, they had to have, he was making the Atlas missile motor. He was doing all this stuff. There has to be a, a file on him. And then they said, oh yeah, we found it. You know, so they sent me 103 pages on him. And he was actually, uh, they identified him within days of starting the, in 1950, they got word uh, late in 1950 that uh, Ted was a known spy. They saw the cables. And uh, so they started a, a uh, nationwide search first to find. We, we should be clear about that. They discovered that because the code had been cracked. Yes. Yeah. And it named Columbia. him and yeah. it named Seville Sachs. So yeah. so they started a, a you know a dragnet search to find out where both of them were. It turned out they were both in Chicago because Ted had gone to uh, to University of Chicago to get a uh, PhD. And uh, so um, they found him pretty quickly and they went and they also found very quickly that his brother was uh, in the Air Force and was working for, uh, you know, at the um, Wright-Patterson Air Base on a secret project developing rocket motors. And so they, uh, in January 6th of 1951, Hoover fired off a personal letter to the head of the OSI, uh, who was a guy who had been his top aide, uh, General Joseph Carroll, C-A-R-R-O-L-L, uh, who was uh, um, the, made the head of the new Office of Special Investigations for the Air Force. Every branch has its own OSI to look for spies and you know criminals in the military. So, uh, so he contacts him and, he, and it was, uh, dear, dear, um, he, he actually said, dear Joseph, you know, I mean, he was a fond a, a guy. It was like a real, uh, uh, um, one of his favorite people. And, uh, he, he, he said, uh, I'm writing to inform you that, uh, your major, um, major Edward, Nathaniel Hall is the son, as the brother of a known atomic spy, and we we thought you'd want to know that, and we would like to uh, question Ed Hall about about this. And so then there's another letter. There's no response from General Carroll, but there's another letter that's dated March sixteenth. March 27th, I'm sorry, uh, which happens to be 11 days after Ted and Savvy Sachs had been called into the FBI, uh, you know, brought in to the FBI and questioned, grilled for three hours about their spying. And 11 days after they get, Hoover writes another letter and he says, Dear General Carroll, thank you for your uh, response to my January 6th letter that you sent on January 14th, explaining that uh, your office would be handling the investigation into the loyalty of Edward Hall. Uh, we, however, our, our investigation has advanced into Ted Hall, and we urgently want to question Ed Hall. So he's saying, I want to question him, even though you are saying, you're going to do it. And he says he urgently wants to question Ed Hall. And what happens is he's put off for 12 weeks and it isn't until June 12th that he finally gets to, to interview Ed Hall. And so then you have the, the FBI report on the interview, which was two hours long, uh, done at Wright-Patterson Air Base. And it notes that two OSI officers are present for the questioning. So they're monitoring. He, he was told that he could only ask about Ted. He, he couldn't be asked questions about himself. And, um, and 12 days after that report, Ed gets promoted to, from major to lieutenant colonel. 
So clearly the Air Force was saying, screw you, we trust him. He's now being made director of the rocket motor program and he's promoted to lieutenant colonel. And shortly after that, the FBI dropped uh, Ted and Savvy Sachs from the uh, security index. You know, the one where they monitor people uh, 24 hours a day and cover their mail and tap their phones. They were removed from that index. And that was after they'd been questioned for three hours and, you know, lied repeatedly that they knew that they'd never been spying and didn't know anything about spying and uh, and had committed enough acts of perjury so that they could have been indicted uh, for things that the FBI could have proven were lies. So uh, so something happened at that point, and I don't have the other part because they have refused to give me any more of the 40 pages in Ed's file that they withheld totally blank. And um, so I have an appeal pending, but uh, I'm gonna have to, I think I'm gonna have to do that with a lawyer and I didn't have time to do it. But so, so basically you have uh, the FBI shut down by the Air Force. So, and, and of course they're, they're both dead uh, yeah. so you I mean, could get those, that, yeah. so people understand the reason that that had to be done by the Air Force is that this was the middle of the McCarthy, the height of the McCarthy period. And he was saying that the army was infested with 300 uh, communists. And, and then if Ted had been exposed by an arrest, right, or even just an, yeah, an arrest and an indictment, uh, the Ed would not have been kept secret. The, the, the journalists would have got, had a, a, a heyday with that, uh, you know, brother of known atomic spy is head of U.S. ICBM program. I mean, this is, that never would have flown. He would have lost his security clearance. The Air Force would have lost their top rocket scientist. And that was a time when the Russians were said to be way in advance of us on uh, missiles. And so Ted, Ed was like their ace in the hole, you know. They didn't want to lose him. So this, this is an amazing story because, and, uh, and when you're telling it, we got to remember it's Ted and Ed. Ed is the uh, older brother who's in the missile program. Ted was in the uh, development of the first atomic bomb. But they remained close, right? And, and, and uh, hello? Yeah. Yeah, and and the interesting thing is that they neither of them were very political, uh, and they went on to do their work, their science, uh, and uh, including Ted, he led a, a normal life. He was not, you know, uh, he, he went the, into he went into biophysics. He changed his major mid midstream at Chicago after. After basically that stuff happened, he had his security clearance listed, lifted. That happened for a different reason, but he wasn't able to, even though he, he was sharing a, an office with Teller, which had the FBI, you know, really uh, in a tizzy. Um, but Teller was hardly ever there. Um, Where was he sharing an office with Teller? University of Chicago. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, Teller was gracious enough to let him have a desk space, and uh, and but but he was basically what I'm told is that he was very he had an appointment at uh, at Chicago after the war, but he was basically spending most of his time on the hydrogen bomb project elsewhere, you know, in Berkeley and stuff, and at Los Alamos. With Alabama. Teller? No, no, Teller was doing that. Yeah, yeah. He was he was he was full out on the hydrogen bomb. So of course the, you know the the, the FBI was thinking, oh, so he's giving them that information. The, the truth is that the Soviets did not need a lot of information about the hydrogen bomb. They had Sakharov, who who had, had it down. It was not uh, oddly enough that the the hydrogen bomb concept was not as complicated as the fission bomb con concept. And the well, um, for people not familiar with all this, yes, the hydrogen bomb what really created mass 
uh, power have thousand actually, times more powerful. Yeah, thousand times. But you're saying the science of it at coming at that point was not as complicated. And anyway, Teller is considered the father of the hydrogen bomb. But as, as you're pointing out, Sakharov, the Soviet scientists uh, and others were also onto it, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was Teller. Teller came up with the idea in 1950 in, in 1942 and right at the beginning of the Manhattan Project and said, why don't you just make this? It's much it's much better, you know, and and Oppenheimer said, no, it's not. And he was right about that, because how do you get it to work? You need to have a, an atomic explosion to get it hot enough so that you can do fission. So they really, I mean, fusion, you really needed to have a hydrogen, an, an atomic fission bomb before you could get a hydrogen bomb. They still haven't figured out how to make a hydrogen bomb without an atomic bomb. So, yeah. um, so you know, Teller was wrong, yeah. but he had the concept down. And so, you know, it, it, it's not that the, the Russians didn't really need to do a spying number to get a hydrogen bomb. And they did get one very fast after the um, U.S. did. I think they blew their first one off a year later and it was a different design that Sakharov first came up with that that was uh, a, a totally different concept than the bomb that the U.S. made. And Sakharov himself was an independent person uh, and re- rebelled somewhat in the Soviet system and got in some and got in trouble. Yeah. Right. And he was a, and he was a, he had the order of Lenin or something. I mean, he did, he did you know, he was really a hero at first. Yeah, but, but then they moved against him. And and the interesting thing is you were writing about really some of the most interesting people that have ever been alive, at least uh, in Western, well, that's not only Western society. Uh, and yet the problem is, and they were given to philosophical questioning, uh, deep thought, challenging, you know, and, and uh, they came to different conclusions. And amazingly, the guy who gives us these missiles and everything he himself probably was somewhat sympathetic to his brother's thinking or capable of some thoughts of his own. Uh, but nonetheless, both he and Ted Hall continued to work when well, they Joan could. Told me, Joan told me that he, she she asked him once. That's you know, his to, wife, Ted's, yeah, Ted's Joan, wife. Joan Hall yeah. was Ted's wife, who he married uh, in 1947, right after the war. He, he met her at Chicago and and uh, fell in love and uh so you see it, you see in the movie, her telling about it, you know, he proposed to her on the floor of that, uh, of Teller's office. We should uh, mention what the movie is in case people want to get it and how they get it, because you worked on it a very basic yeah, I was way. A producer and it was made, of it. Yeah. And, and it was made by a terrific filmmaker, right? Yeah. Steve James. I, I went, I went to Steve with the idea because I knew him from having uh, participated in a film that he made earlier, the Abacus movie. And give the uh, name of the film that the, the 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 one we're talking about. Oh, Abacus, one, yeah. Abacus. No, no, Small. no, the one about Ted Hall that you. Oh, a, a compassionate spy. Yeah, and so that, people can get that right. It's out. And, yeah, it's had a theater run, uh, and now it's. I I don't think it's playing in a lot of places, but uh, you can get it by if you know someone in a you know place that could get, could order it. You can get it from Magnolia Films. They're the distributor. And uh, it's now available for streaming at Amazon, uh, at Apple TV, at Hulu, which is Magnolia, uh, at Vudu and Google Films. All the, you can go to any of those. And some of them, it's pretty cheap, like two ninety nine and stuff. Some of them, it's six ninety nine. Right. And then he was he's a great filmmaker. We have a podcast that I did with the two of you that I'll link. Uh, to this that we also did a, as a KCRW podcast, and uh, and he's an award winning uh, filmmaker. And so you said you went to him with the idea. Yeah, I brought him the idea because when I when I when I you know I, we sort of we sort of jumped from something. I was explaining how I had uh, written that uh, first article saying that Ted and uh, Klaus Fuchs should get posthumous Nobel Peace Prize is, is a controversial thing to say, which I meant to be, you know, kind of a, get, to stir things up. 
And instead, I got a letter from Joan saying, Dear Dave, I'm reading your article in Counterpunch uh, with tears in my eyes. I'm Ted's widow, and you're the first journalist who got him. And, and she, she said, we need to talk. So uh, when my daughter was graduating the next year uh, from Oxford with her doctorate, I, uh, my wife and I went over there to see the graduation. It's a real pageantry thing from 1500s, you know, the graduations they do there. And so we went over. I told her we were going to be there. And she said, then you and your wife both have to come and see me. And uh, it, not just for lunch or dinner, you know, you have to come over and spend the night. And, you know, <coughs> we, we really need to talk. So we went there. We became fast friends. And, uh, you know, I said, this is an amazing story about your husband and, and you. And, and uh, I think that, you know, I, the bombshell book is terrific. I had read it by then. And I said, but the thing is that they, when they wrote that, they didn't know that the U.S. really had plans, serious plans to destroy the Soviet Union uh, before it got the bomb. And your husband was right to do what he did because he prevented that. He made that so that couldn't happen. That's incredible. So you really need to have another book. And she said, oh, no, I, I, I couldn't do that. She said, when Ted got exposed, we were put through hell. We had for weeks, we had uh, media scrum outside the house, people jumping out of the bushes with cameras and taking our pictures if we went for a walk. She said it was a nightmare. And uh, I wouldn't want to go through that again with a book that is an expose of everything else about the story. And, and I said, OK, I understand that. And then she said, well, anyway, um, there's a British film group that's making a, a dramatic movie about Ted and uh, I'm consulting with them. They're asking me questions for, for, the, for that. And I'm, I'm happy with that, a drama. You know, that's not going to have the same results. And uh, I said, that's great. And so I just shelved it, you know, went away and thought, OK. And because she was essential to that story. I mean, if you didn't have her cooperation, you couldn't, you couldn't do a book. You couldn't do anything. And so uh, uh, I uh, just wrote it off and started but we should be uh, clear she as opposed to Oppenheimer's wife and all that she did not know Ted during that period of, of the no, no she met and, him in 1947 and then when he revealed the tour which was when when he proposed he, he proposed yeah. he proposed to her uh uh and then uh he said she said he, he said will you marry me I'm in love with you she said yes yes and then he said, he, she says he got really serious. And he said, but before you say yes, um, I need to tell you something. And then he told her and he said, you know, I, I was working at Los Alamos and I helped to make the atomic bomb. And then I decided that it was really dangerous for them to have it. And so um, I gave it to the Russians and, and she said, well, now, this wasn't in the movie. She, she, the way she told it to me, she said, and now I really wanted, want to marry you. You know, she thought it was heroic, and which, which I think it was. I mean, it was very dangerous to do that. So, uh, but that, that was uh, 1947, and they got married, and uh, fairly soon after had a daughter, and then they were terrified because of the Rosenbergs and seeing them get condemned to death. So they just lay low, especially after he was interrogated. And Let's put that really... into the context here. The, the Roosevelt's really, I mean, the Rosenbergs, uh, this is like a sideshow to, to, to the real issue of how the Russian Soviets uh, got this information. Oh yeah, the the, the only the, the really the, you know the Rosenbergs were not atomic spies, and in fact they weren't convicted of being atomic spies. They were charged with it, but they weren't convicted of it because it was so. Pathetic. You should give a little setting because most people don't know much about this. And and uh, uh, yes, this is the famous atomic spy case, and they died for it. And and Ethel Roosevelt clearly had nothing or very little to do with it. But anyway. Introduce well, that here. It's gone on this long. If you're willing to stick with me, because I, 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 I just think this is a fabulous retelling 
of the story. And by the way, I want to pay a compliment to you. Really, this is a great story about journalism that, you know, uh, that you pursued all of these things and you do it with obvious intelligence and you're not afraid of the science and you dig deeply and then you use available tools like getting these documents with uh, FOIA and all that. And so I, I think this is really a great case study, really, of, of how journalism can be so effective. And then we're going to get to the downside at the end, why you can't anybody get get anybody to review your book. <laughs> but, yeah, no, it's but, true. But, but let's go through the Roosevelts first. <laughs> yeah, well, well, the Rosenbergs were... Um, Rosenbergs, I can't. You know, Julius Rosenberg was a spy. There's no question. I mean, I've talked with, with both his sons, Robert and Michael, and, and they know that too. They've agreed that, that, that he was a spy. They don't agree that he was an atomic spy. And, uh, and, I, and I think that they're correct because what he did was he, his, his main, actually the biggest thing he gave the Soviets was the, um, the um, proximity fuse that the U.S. had invented, which allows a shell or a bomb or a rocket to explode before it hits the target so that it, it sprays out a, a, a you know, sort of like a shotgun instead of a rifle, you know, and and that was a very difficult thing to do. If things go in a thousand miles an hour and you want it to blow up before it hits, right? So uh, that proximity fuse they had succeeded in making and he gave those plans to the Soviets. Um, they he was running a bunch of spies um so he he was responsible you know for for them um and by the total i think this is total luck and there's a lot of things in this whole story that uh, that are total luck uh david greenglass who was married to uh to uh, ethel ethel's sister yeah um, was, so he was the brother-in-law of Julius and Ethel. He ratted out his sister uh, and, and uh, claimed that she had typed the uh, report that he gave them from Los Alamos. And so that was used to make her an accomplice. And he later admitted after uh, he got out of jail and you know years later, that he had made that up or he had been fed that by the FBI in, and it wasn't in his grand jury testimony either. And it was, uh, you know, it was a fabrication by the prosecution that uh, she was culpable. Now, whether or not she knew her husband was a spy, who knows? I mean, I, knowing, knowing that they were so close, I, I find it hard to believe that she didn't know what he what he was doing, even if she didn't participate, but you talk you know, about Ethel, uh, Ethel Rosenberg, somebody. Yeah, that that's Is not it. I think she was. I I think that she was charged because um, it was used as a uh, extortion to get Julius to confess, which was what they really wanted to happen, and they wanted to. I don't think they really needed them to name names. I think they wanted him to confess that he was a spy and, and that maybe they wanted him to tell who his other spies were. Um, I don't think it was a matter of naming other communists or anything like that, that who cares, you know, but, uh, but that, that was a setup. And, and actually uh, Peter Kuznets, when I told him about this story and he wrote a blurb, nice blurb on the, for the book, um, he, he's, he's the an American of, University historian and he yeah, wrote and he a book on the Cold War with Oliver Stone. Yeah, yeah he, read, he runs the uh, nuclear history uh, project at that school. I forget the name of it, but it's American like University, I think, isn't yeah, it? At uni yeah, but there's a, he runs a, oh. a center there on, for the study of atomic history. And uh, and he knows it backwards and forwards. Yeah, he's the, he's professor of history and director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Well, yeah. well he's I'm reading. He's... I'm reading this off the jacket of your book. Well, let's not forget oh, okay, the book. Right. You've done a lot of work on this. It's not being noticed by 
the New York Times or the, you know, others. So here it is and it's available and uh, check it out. Uh, but go ahead. Uh, so, so, th- so, 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 thank you. <laughs> so, so um, the, uh, that was, uh, it's a commercial break. Um, <laughs> so the, he said, uh, he thought that Ted, if if they hadn't, you know, people said the FBI excuse argument is that they didn't go after Ted because they couldn't get a conviction. They did. They they, they would have been told that they uh, that they couldn't use the Venona transcripts because they had obtained them without a search warrant and stuff like that. Uh, I think that's complete BS. Uh, that they're embarrassed as hell that they weren't able to arrest him and that they had to cave in to the Air Force, and they just wanted this story to go away. And um, and they- But just so know, I'm clear here, you're saying they didn't go after Ted Hall because the Air Force was protecting his brother. Yeah, I'm saying that's why, but they say yeah. that their, their own historian says that they didn't arrest him because he, because they couldn't have gotten a conviction because of the way they had the evidence that, that, you know, the only evidence they had against him really was those Venona transcripts saying that. Yeah, uh, Ted Hall. They didn't have any, uh, Ed Hall, his brother. Nothing on Ed because Ed wasn't a spy. And, and the, uh, and the thing about Ed was that uh, he was, um, he was the reason that the Air Force said to the, to the FBI that they couldn't they couldn't arrest Ted, and and the, the the proof of that is that even when they stopped investigating him, there were never any leaks about Ted. He never it never got to a journalist. It never got to anybody in the uh, McCarthy hearings. It never got any to anybody at HUAC. I mean, that Hoover was a notorious leaker for his own interest, and he never leaked. So even though he was probably really ticked off at the Air Force, he never leaked about Ted, which is amazing. And and uh, and he did try to go after him later, uh, after Ed was out of the Air Force and retired and just doing consulting work for NASA. Um, the... Uh, he was in. He they moved in 1962 to uh, th- to get away from the environment in the U.S. That was afraid that the investigation would pick up. So they, he got a job at Cambridge uh, in England, and so they moved there with the family. And uh, the daughters have English accents. I mean, you know, they went when they were pretty young, and um, and uh, when he had to renew his work visa. He didn't get blocked from leaving the country, um, but when he got to England, uh, he, he got, had his work papers already, and he went to work. and And I guess one or two years later, uh, he had to renew his work visa, and it should have been, you know, an automatic thing. You send in your passport; it comes back with your visa, and it didn't come. It didn't come, and he called and asked, and they said, uh, "You need to come in in person." So he and Joan walked over uh, from their house in Newnham to uh, the to the campus, and they and they got to the uh, to the office that they need to go to. And a guy from MI MI five met him, who said, uh, "Listen, Ted, we know what you did, but we'd like you to to just you know tell us about it. We're not the FBI. Why don't you just come clean, and and explain what you did." And so, so Ted left and he was walking back home with Joan and he said, you know, it really would be good to just clear the air. And, you know, I don't like living in, you know, in secret like this. And maybe I should just tell what I did. I mean, it's years later. And Joan stopped dead in her tracks, she said, and she turned to him and she said, don't you dare do that. It won't, it, 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 you can't trust them. You'll end up, you know, getting arrested and maybe I'll get arrested too. And our kids will end up being orphans. You know, just don't 
tell them anything. You don't, you did nothing and you don't know anything. And, uh, and so he said, you think? And she said, yes, I think. And she stopped him from doing it. But, um, you know, he, he, the, the, but, but, you know, you asked once about Ed uh, and his relationship with Ted. Um, Joan told me that uh, Ted was diagnosed in, I think it was mid-1980s, with um, terminal kidney cancer, maybe early early 90s, with terminal kidney cancer from the work he did. He was blowing up lanthanum, which is extremely, extremely radioactive, and uh, just getting the dust they were just hiding in a wooden shed when they'd blow these things up uh, over and over. And, and you know, so he was dying of cancer. And so uh, when the word went to his brother that he was dying of cancer, they the family flew over to see him. And, uh, and Joan was walking down the sidewalk with Ed and he collapsed on the street and passed out and they called an ambulance and he wound up in the hospital and he was diagnosed with a, a massive bleeding ulcer that he'd had for some time, obviously. And his daughter told me that uh, Sheila, uh, Sheila um, Hall, who's a TV producer out in LA, she was a girl, a young girl then. And, and she said, uh, dad, how could you have flown on an airplane with that? and not told us you had it because they said that was, he could have died on the plane. And he said, that kid is dying and I'm going to be here for him. And, you know, th that's, that was his uh, relationship. I don't go through that again. He, that... he told her, she said, how could you have gotten on a plane to come here? knowing that you had a bleeding ulcer because he did know you know I mean, oh this is ed hurt. ed Hall. this is ed yeah oh, he, oh, flew oh. There, he flew there in a, a a highly critical condition of bleeding uh you know out his rectum uh that he, he because he wanted to be with his brother he said he said that kid is dying i i want to be being ted ted yeah yeah, that's yeah. how he viewed him. He was my kid brother, you know. He also told her, uh, you know, later after all of this came out and I visited again, she said, she said, Ed, I really want to thank you. They were alone together. She said, I really want to thank you for how you handled this all the way through, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, because it threatened your career and all of that. And, and he said, how can I do anything else? He's my brother. If he saw, if yeah. he thought that he he said, if he thought he was doing the right thing, he was doing the right thing. That's how he put it. Wow. If Ted that's talking about his younger brother, if he thought he was in, so let's end this with what you've said a, a few times now, which most people listening to this will think will be will not be able to accept or will find it absurd which is that maybe this made it a safer world. This is a very, very controversial statement, right? Yes, and, yes. And so why don't we focus on that? Because uh, it's not going to be very obvious. We have a view of uh, Stalin's Russia and then even what happened after. And uh, most Americans, whether they like the existence of the bomb or not, feel it's good that we that the U.S. has it. Uh, and uh, so... What, well, what, let me... Let defend me read yourself. Some, <laughs> well, there's, there's, two, there's a couple things I, I want to read from the book that I think are the best answers to that. The first is a, 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 a bubble quote I put on the epilogue of the book by uh, Frank Close, who's a, a professor emeritus of physics at Oxford and you know knows this stuff and wrote it brilliant book in 2019 and really exciting read on the whole pursuit of Klaus Fuchs. And uh, I mean, he's a great, he's a great writer. I, I, it's called, uh, tr it's called uh, Trinity. And you should definitely read that book by Frank Close. He said, um, 
Seven decades later, this was a quote from his book, seven decades later, the survival of life on Earth in the atomic age. Let me put my glasses on and read it since we're doing a recording. Um, it says, seven days later, or <laughs> I tried again. Seven decades later, the survival of life on Earth in the atomic age may be due to the mutually assured destruction that Fuchs and Ted Hall helped to, ma help to mature. And that was it. And the other thing is, right when I finished the book, I had already, they'd already edited the manuscript. I, I uh, read a review of, um, of the film, actually, by a guy at, who works with the Atomic Sci the Association of Atomic Scientists, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And in it, he recounts something uh, really amazing. And I, I decided to make it the end of my book because it was so good. So I called my editor and said, I got to add this to the, la to the epilogue. He says, um, Hugh, Gusterf Hugh Gusterson, a professor of anthropology and public policy, that's the guy, at the University of British Columbia, writing in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, recalls how in the mid-90s, he met with a nuclear weapons designer, this is after, after Glasnost started, who had witnessed the first test in August 1949 of the atomic, Soviet atomic bomb that he and Ted Hall helped to create. He writes, in what was admittedly an inartfully phrased question, I asked him, how did you feel when you realized you'd given Stalin the bomb? He looked at me steadily from under craggy eyebrows as the question was translated and then said evenly, I felt at last I could sleep again after four years. Finally, we were safe from the Americans. Yes. What does that mean? That's heavy. Yeah, right. I mean, these what are guys, he... these are guys who, who, you know, like you said, these physicists are amazing. You know, when my dad was a, a NMIT engineering student at MIT. Uh, he started during the war, then, then he got drafted because uh, he had to leave when his father died of suddenly of uh, colorectal cancer. Uh, and so he was in the Marines during the war. Uh, and when he went back, he was on the GI Bill. And uh, he, he said that there was a petition going around to stop the bomb. And he said he was taking it around and he discovered that every time he showed it to an engineer, they would say, well, you know, I mean, all great progress in, in humanity has been because of research done during wartime. You know, it's just it's a it's an engine of development and it's just you, you can't get rid of it. And uh, and it has a useful purpose, things like that. When he, when he would go to the physicists, they would all sign it. They'd just say, oh, yeah, we got to stop this. <laughs> you know, physicists are different. They're, they're, uh, yeah, there are some who weren't. There's places like Sam, guys like Sam Cohen, who was taped in the, in the, who invented the uh, concept of the neutron bomb, you know, sort of the, the uh, realtor's bomb. Doesn't destroy the buildings, but it, kills all the people but but physicists for the most part are humanists but let me end this by putting this other question to you because the the assumption that you made was that if the soviets had not developed the bomb that the united states was going to use its nuclear arsenal to destroy them that you, you put a, a you're not saying that's a possibility. You're saying, do you think this is was a, a likelihood, a plausible consideration, or is this some theoretical discussion at a conference, or what? No, this was a massive project to build 400 or, and more. I mean, after after the 400 bombs were not able to be used because the Russians had exploded a bomb and developed and were going to have more before they. They didn't have enough 
bombers yet. They were the other thing they did is they ramped up production of the B-29 after the war. Why? Because they needed more to carry the bombs. And and they were also repairing all the ones that came back from the war damaged so that they could have them. And they developed, uh, they, they worked to develop the B-36, which was able to carry the hydrogen bomb. Uh, and all of those things were done in the 40s. So why were they doing that if they weren't you know, it was an enormous amount of money they were spending if they weren't going to use it. And and I also think that, uh, you know, I, I look at how the U.S., how many, how many wars we've been in and how many people we've killed. Millions of people have died in American uh, wars of choice since World War II. Three million in Vietnam because of, in uh, Korea mostly North Korea because of the carpet bombings that were done of that country by the U.S. And it, it, we had no hesitation to use, uh, you know, to do nuclear-sized destruction of Korea and of Vietnam uh, without the atomic bomb, which we couldn't use because the Russians had the bomb. But, but you know, there, there's, there was no compunction in the U.S. about uh, that level of destruction and what they were doing in, in what the idea that they would have had preemptively destroyed the Soviet Union to prevent it from getting a bomb is, is uh, not only totally comprehensible to me, knowing the people that were involved and uh, the fact that we did use it twice for no good reason except intimidating the Soviet Union war was over. I, I, I go into that at depth. I mean, it's very clear that that, that didn't, didn't have to happen except as a demonstration. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was not just, these weren't war games. These were actual, and, and you know, it's supported too by the work that uh, Daniel Ellsberg did in that amazing book, uh, The Doomsday Machine, where he talks about the research he did for the Rand Corp into uh, the war plans and and strategy that the U.S. had all through the fifties and into the sixties. Yeah, I mean, look, this is um, a reality check in a way, uh, and and if interesting, you know, because most of most people accept a far more benign view of U.S. intentions. And yet when, and and this is, I think, really left out of the Oppenheimer movie. Uh, And you say they, they, Oppenheimer did insist on keeping a campus atmosphere at Los Alamos. And, you know, having interviewed people like Beta and myself and others who were in that program, they had a view of the American military industrial complex that was quite realistic. They worked for General Grove. They were under the restraints of the military. They tried to plead with the president. Um, And, you know, so you can't just say these physicists were naive. They didn't do what Ted Hall did, but they certainly had great reservations about what they had unleashed. Uh, And uh, the, the, difficulty of, of controlling it. And so there's a real uh, cognitive dissonance here. There's a disconnect uh, that's very difficult to get through in understanding our history. Uh, if you start off the assumption that the American government is is a benign, if sometimes uh, somewhat irrational force or uh, so forth, maybe uh, under the goading of a of, of McCar- Senator McCarthy and so forth. But what you're saying is the scientists, it's a good way to end this, they looked at power up close. They were not in some lab somewhere. They were not just, you know, on an ivory tower. They were dealing with government power and the military industrial complex at a gut level. They were, you know, their movement was monitored. Their paycheck came from it. They were screened and followed. And they were having 
these discussions with their government counterparts about what's going on and what are we going to do here? How are we going to use it? And a project that started when it looked like Nazi Germany might dominate the world ends up being a project to control the post-world politics, post-war politics. That's a different kettle of fish. And I think that, and this is what I want to end on this. We've taken the time. You've taken the time, uh, uh, you know, but uh, we've done uh, an hour and 40 minutes or so forth. I, I want to understand why your book is not treated as, as a, a center of an important discussion that needs to take place. There's all this interest in the Oppenheimer movie. You guys made a good film about the subject, and now you've issued a book. And the movie didn't get the attention that I thought it would. I thought at least with the interest in, in the Oppenheimer movie, there would be, you know, uh, and people should definitely watch the movie, uh, The Compassionate Spy, and the book, The Story of Ted Hall. What is the response? Why why isn't it being reviewed and discussed? Has anybody found fault with it or some glaring error or something? No, there's no nobody's found fault with it. And I think that what the problem is that the book has is that it it really questions a, a, a fun, the fundamental mythology of the United States post-war history, which is that you know, we are all about promoting democracy around the world, and that's why we do what we do, and uh, that, you know, our motives are sterling when we do that. We, we are, uh, we don't have self-interest, we're, we're, we're generous, we do things to help the world, and we don't do things out of crass, crass interest and desire to control and and i that's just demonstrably untrue i mean if if everything from the coup in chile i mean in my life I, i'm 74 i'm a i'm a early baby boomer 1949 i was born and uh all through my life there's been wars that the united states has been in um i i i spent uh when I was 15, I was in gymnasium in Darmstadt, which was one of the cities that was test, te, used, they used it as a test of firebombing to create, to create a firestorm because it was a wooden city with no uh, in, military interest at all, no factories, nothing. It was a cultural capital of Hesse. And... Uh, uh, on the way into the city, uh, getting a ride from Frankfurt uh, train, uh, Frankfurt Airport uh, to the Darmstadt Technische Hochschule, where my father was going to have a sabbatical, I saw these two conic mountains, you know, in the middle of the Rhine River uh, f floodplain. And I said to the driver, what are those mountains? Are those volcanoes? And he said, no, that's Darmstadt uh, ruins that were trucked out there after they bulldozed this, the rubble of the city from the bombing. And, and, uh, and he said, that's, that's got everything in it, bones, you know, burned bones of people that were, that were burned. Uh, the city, the old city is right there in those two mountains. And the <coughs> shocking thing for me in 1965, uh, I, I never heard about that. And it, it was like what happened to Dresden, but on a smaller scale. It, we, we did terrible things. And, and we did terrible things in Vietnam uh, when I was a war resistor. Uh, that, that just appalling things. And, and uh, we, want, we almost used nukes there twice. Once in, uh, in uh, you know, to offering a bomb to the French, which was wisely turned down by Eisenhower. Uh, when they were when they were trapped at Dien Bien Phu, and then uh, once at Cameron at uh, Quezon, when the Marines were trapped, and the bombs were actually shipped to Vietnam, but uh, they weren't used because uh, of two reasons. One is that the Marines managed to break out of the encirclement, and the other was that uh, the president 
at that time, Johnson said, what? The generals had brought the bombs over there. And he, he was really upset. So, uh, you know, it didn't happen. But they, they, these people are nuts. You know, I want to look final. I mentioned earlier, and we looked at that picture over there. If you could go on that I have stolen award that you won. Uh, people on the radio won't be able to see it. You got, you got I, Ted you know, Hall. I always, thought, I always thought this would have been a perfect story for I.F. Stone to have done. Wow. It's good that you mentioned it. Let's see Ted Hall, first of all, for people who have video or watching this, and you see how young he was. And then next to it, swing over to Izzy. Izzy was this grizzled re reporter, and, uh, it, and you won the Izzy Award. And I just want to maybe end this by paying tribute to, to, to that. Uh, it's okay. We can go back to you now for a minute <laughs> if you want. Uh, and uh, I'll conclude this. But Izzy was a, a very respectable journalist, columnist in New York and so forth, professional. And then when the Korean War happened and after he dared to write a book called The Hidden History of the Korean War, I was just a young kid and I read this and my, when I brought, raised it with some of my teachers in school, they thought, no, no, that's nuts. And he argued that the Korean War was a preemptive war and was unnecessary. And that it basically was a response to that. The wrong people had won in China. Uh, the communist revolution, Mao, uh, defeated Chiang Kai-shek and they'd taken over China uh, a year before. And this was really a way of putting pressure on China. And after all, in defense of and Korea was divided by the war, north and south. But in, in the leveling of North Korea and uh, all all of Korea, really, or just about every building there, uh, was really an attempt, and, and well, worked. The Chinese intervened, but instead of the Chinese uh, collapsing and being defeated, they actually took over Korea and then pulled back. So the whole question of the Yalu River and crossing it, and he wrote a book called The Hidden History of the Korean War. And he was destroyed as a journalist for a while. He sort of bounced back. And and I just remember in my own journalistic career, Izzy's always been uh, one of my really great heroes. And, and, and it's just that he, you know, as a kid, I would read his column in, the, I don't know what, the New York Post or PM magazine or something while I was going to school. And, and I wonder, who is this guy? And uh, now he's honored. There's a program at Harvard and at Berkeley and so forth honoring him. But really what we're talking about is the entire narrative of the Cold War and of global politics and the U.S. rise to preeminence. Uh, the whole issue now still dividing us with China. Turn out the Chinese communists turn out to be very strong capitalists and very good at it. But nonetheless, and we don't like Russia, even when it's run by an anti-Russian uh, communist now, Putin, and who defeated the Communist Party. But there's this whole narrative. And it's interesting, your, your example of this Ted Hall and the climate that existed there and the questioning of, of the essential uh, uh, motivation of the Cold War is so critical to where we are now. And, and again, you know, we're like cruising... Now for a kind of confrontation with China, and how did that happen? You know, we knew they were com competitive as far as making phones and things, you know, and lots of T-shirts and all that. But now, I mean, really, we're gearing up for what may be the end of humanity. We certainly have not settled things with Russia. We're there, and and actually, ironically, paying tribute to Ive Stone, he was one of the first who went in when Israel was created, and he was quite supportive. Uh, of that effort. And yet we see now a source of, of tension that it got, got into a Cold War drama, uh, dragging the Mideast into it. Uh, so I, I, it's a rambling way to end, but I, I, I just think it's appalling that a, a really important book like yours, uh, well-documented, knowledgeable, you have all the resources, uh, that what remains of what's the traditional media that they don't have to cover it. I, I, I just think it's a scandal. Let me hold the book up again for the people who can see on the video. It's the story of Ted Hall, the teenage atomic spy who may have saved the world. 
it's still a big question uh, whether he did what the right thing or not. Uh, it's still a question people should debate. Uh, spy for no country, that can be debated. But what cannot be debated is the complexity and information in this book suggesting uh, that the bomb didn't have to be developed. It certainly didn't have to be expanded in a way, and it did not have to fuel uh, the Cold War in the way that it did. Uh, I want to end on that note. I want to thank you for being incredibly generous with your time. And uh, I want to thank uh, Laura Kondaragian and <clears throat> Chris Ho at uh, KCRW, uh, who post these shows, a very good public radio station. I want to thank our executive producer, Joshua Shear, who gets me to do these things. Uh, I want, oh, I want to thank a special out, shout out to Diego Ramos, who will be writing the introduction, who is a graduate of Townsend Hall High School that we discussed, and uh, <coughs> uh, Max Jones, who does the video where people can actually see the book. And I want to thank the JKW Foundation for consistently supporting uh, this show and our ability to keep uh, producing it. And in memory of Gene Stein, a strongly independent, fiercely independent uh, uh, public intellectual and journalist and uh, writer. Uh, and on that note, see you next week with another edition of Sheer Intelligence. 